Hey there, I'm Sal, thanks for checking out the video. Today I want to talk through a couple things that I don't love about my first gen Tundra. First off, I've had the truck for over three years and I love this thing, it's been really good to me. It's never left me stranded anywhere. Um, but at the same time, it's a 25 year old truck. There's been crazy advancements in technology and safety and comfort and efficiency and all sorts of things uh, since this truck came out. And I don't think it's necessarily the best purchase for everybody. So I just kind of want to lay out some of the things I don't love about it and kind of help you make the decision on if it'd be right for you. So let's get into it. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about might be a little bit controversial here, but Toyota reliability. And here I'm not trying to dispute whether or not Toyotas are reliable. This truck has been great to me. It's never left me stranded, like I said. Um, I have no doubt every morning that when I come out and start this truck, it's going to start right up and it's going to get me to work. No doubt in my mind. There's tons of examples of these trucks with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of miles. I'm right at about a quarter million miles right now. There's plenty of examples well into the 800, 900,000. I don't know if we've ever hit a million with this 4.7. I know the second gen Tundra has had a couple examples hit a million miles, but regardless, they're plenty reliable. I'm not trying to dispute that. What I'm more talking about is everything around that. <laughs> so the engine and drivetrain, drive train, awesome. All the other stuff, it's just, it's not so much that it's not reliable, it's just the fact that it's a 25 year old truck at this point. So uh, things like bushings and bearings and gaskets and other things with lifespans like coil packs or um, ball joints, especially on these trucks, things like that, that need to be addressed. And on my truck, I've had to replace a starter. You use it every day, multiple times a day for 25 years things like a starter are gonna to need to be replaced at some point. My driver wheel bearing needed to be replaced. Um, and that's one of those things you really don't wanna wait on. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen the video where the truck's going down the highway and its wheel just falls off and then the CRV or whatever goes flying when it hits it. You don't wanna be that guy. So wheel bearings need to be addressed. Um, the carrier bearing on the drive shaft is a common thing that needs to re be replaced. Um, suspension components, my shocks need to be replaced, um, the bushings could be replaced, uh, they're just getting kind of old and, and cracked, um, not a necessity. Coil packs, I need to replace all the coil packs on my truck, I started having misfires here and there over time and I just figured spend the 500 bucks, get all new OEM coil packs and be done with that. Um, I had a seized brake caliper, that's not Toyota's fault that the brake caliper seized, you know, but it's something on a 25 year old truck, you have to expect stuff like that's gonna happen. So I'm not trying to, like I said, I'm not trying to say that these trucks aren't reliable. I'm trying to maybe help clarify a misconception that when you buy a Toyota reliability, buy a truck with Toyota reliability, you're not gonna have to touch it ever. You don't have to spend any cost on maintenance. And I think that's something I was a little bit naive to. Uh, when I bought the truck, I was like, oh, Toyota Tundra, everyone always says that thing will run forever, good to go. And it will run forever, but you gotta feed it parts. You gotta feed it bearings and coil packs and bushings and suspension components and things that just go bad over time, starters. So um, yeah, I'm not gonna beat a dead horse here, not go on too long, but just because Toyotas are reliable, which they are, it, they still require a little bit of upkeep on the side um, in order to, to run for that million miles that you know you see all over the place. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll be done with that now. <laughs> Next up, another kind of annoying thing are the doors and the back seat space on this truck. I'll do a little demo here, but the way that the doors are oriented, I know there's other trucks that have been laid out this way, so it's not necessarily the Tundra's fault for this, but if you have an access cab, you'll know what I'm talking about here. So the front doors are open normally, and then the back doors open reverse. And I see why they do it, to have better access to the back seat and everything, but man, it, you can so easily get caught between the doors. <laughs> it sounds silly, but there's so many times either I'm loading groceries or whatever, and you're parked kind of close to another car, and you get caught between the doors and you're like, how the heck did I get in this spot right now? <laughs> and uh, you're trying to close the door and you're bumping. It's such a pain. And uh, yeah, 
it's just not not the best design and obviously if you have a double cab tundra it'll uh, alleviate this problem but yeah the doors are really really annoying <laughs> and then the back seat space it is tight back there it is really really tiny yes in theory this truck could sit six people with the bench seat across the front i've had five in here three across the front and two in the back and I don't think anyone in the car at that time wanted to do it again, <laughs> including me. It was just really tight, but um, yes, it's possible. I just wouldn't consider getting an access cab if you plan on carrying people in the back pretty often. A double cab has significantly more space, full doors in the back, and that's definitely the, the better option for you. Um, access cab, you can do it in a pinch, but even me, I do, I carry people maybe once every couple months. And even then I'm like, man, I should consider upgrading to a double cab <laughs> because it is just terrible for whoever's in the back seat. Kids might be a little bit better, um, but any adults, it is uh, it is not fun. Okay, so next up is the fuel economy and the engine and transmission sort of tuning. So fuel economy wise, obviously I'm getting a little bit worse fuel economy because of the bigger all-terrain tires that I have in the, the leveling kit. But generally speaking, it's only maybe one mile per gallon worse than it was before doing these upgrades. So I get around 50 miles per gallon in the city, just everyday driving. And if I'm doing like a strictly highway drive, I can stretch it up to like 17. And yeah, before these, maybe add one to both of those. Um, but regardless, it's not great. With that said, it's debatable on whether this is a con or not because obviously new cars get much better gas mileage but the new tundra i'm pretty sure it gets like the 2023 tundra 2024 whatever i'm pretty sure it still gets like 16 17 miles per gallon or something like that so um yeah maybe it's not a con but it's not great getting that that poor of gas mileage um and then the other part of it is the engine and transmission tuning so these trucks, the early ones through 2004, uh, have, this blew my mind when someone told me in the comments, because I had it wrong, they have a three-speed transmission. And then the fourth gear is the overdrive gear when the torque converter locks. Um, I had that wrong. I thought it was a four-speed with a fifth overdrive gear, but that is the newer trucks in 2005 and 2006. So the three-speed transmission, with so few gears, it's hard for the truck to be at the optimal RPM for torque uh, at at all times. Like it's just always in as low of a gear as it can possibly be in. And if you're trying to pass someone on the highway or even just around town trying to speed up to make a light or whatever, it's it's hard to get the power down sometimes. Or that's a bad way of wording it. It's hard to get the power out of the truck sometimes. <laughs> Um, I'm not one of those people who loves to stamp on it and let the downshift and wring it out. I just, I guess I like to treat my, my truck a little bit better than that. The gearing is just not optimal for, um, you know, getting the power whenever you want it. With these new trucks, they got 10 speed transmissions, whatever. And, uh, you know, you're always in the right gear for whatever you need to do. It'll just shift quick and you'll be good to go. But with this, with such few gears, I find that it feels really laggy um, and sluggish especially like getting on the highway or trying to get around somebody or, or in those sort of situations. So yeah, being a little bit lower on power and with the, the older uh, transmission, um, you can just definitely feel it trying to keep up with modern cars merging onto the highway or, or something like that. With uh, keeping in, in that highway mindset here, another thing that I don't love about this truck is the road trip comfort. I have taken a number of road trips in this car going from Florida up to Virginia and back multiple times, taking multiple trips to South Carolina from here, like five, six hours. And then I've done a three hour trip to North Carolina and back dozens of times. <laughs> and I'll say after about two hours, you're, you're starting to feel kind of sore. There's zero lumbar support, at least in these bench seats um, on the access cab here. I don't know if the captain's chairs are any better, but after two hours, your back's feeling it on the longer drives, five hours, like you need something in your lower back. So if I know I'm doing a long trip, I just get a pillow, stick it back there. It makes it a lot better. But um, driving around town every day, I think the seats are actually pretty comfy. Um, but the, the road trip comfort is, it, it drops off pretty drastically after a couple hours. Just 
having no lower back support is is tough. I know I have bad posture anyways, <laughs> um, but it's just accentuated when when you, you don't have anything supporting your back. So, yeah, if you do a ton of driving, maybe I would uh, take that into consideration. Okay, so the next thing is kind of silly, but there's no cabin air filter on these trucks, and that doesn't really affect any day-to-day -day stuff. Um, it's not a big deal, but it just gets a little bit annoying when leaves and the little helicopter twirlies and dirt and whatever else kind of gets sucked into that cabin air box, and then you can hear it rattling around, and it's just kind of uh, just kind of annoying to be honest. <laughs> it's easy enough to take off, take out that fan. I've made a video about that. And you can clean around in there, but Inevitably, you know, a month later, a couple weeks later, whatever, you'll end up with some leaves back in there and you'll hear them twirling around. So, uh, yeah, just, just kind of annoying. Okay, next thing I want to talk about is the key fob reception. So, another one that sounds kind of silly, but first of all, pairing the key fob to the truck, pretty straightforward. Um, I have a video about that if you uh, need to figure it out. The hard part about the key fobs is figuring out which one matches to your truck. I spent so long trying to figure it out and it's just confusing. There's not a ton of good information out there about it, but once you figure it out and you get it paired up, it's great, except sometimes I'll be standing right here and the truck won't unlock, and other times I'll be 20 feet away and the truck unlocks no problem. It's kind of spotty. One thing that I did that really improved it was just putting a new battery in. It was something I didn't really think about. <laughs> and then I was like, one day I was like, you know what, maybe a new battery would help. So I did it and I noticed a big improvement but it's still uh, pretty hit or miss. Like sometimes I can unlock it from the house, other times I can't. Just worth noting, the key fob reception kind of sucks. Okay, so the last thing is more for you DIYers. Um, and if you want to change the oil on the truck by yourself, uh, you got to drop the skid plate, this big heavy metal skid plate from the bottom of the engine, uh, which is cool that the truck has it because it's great for if you're going to take it off road or whatever. But uh, I, I've had people tell me that you can do it without dropping the skid plate, but I just don't see how that's possible. <laughs> um, and it's easy enough to take off. It's five bolts holding it up and then a couple screws that hold these, um, these side guards in place. So it only adds a couple minutes, but it's just kind of a pain to have to take it off every time. It's kind of awkward. You're like laying under the truck and like holding this big heavy metal thing as you're undoing the last screw and then it, it's just awkward. People sell aftermarket skid plates that have a cutout for it, um, but if you don't want to spend that money, you're going to have to remove the stock one to change the oil every time. Again, only for you DIYers, but I just think it's worth noting. So a lot of talking in this video. Thanks for bearing with me. I know they're a lot more exciting when I'm actually doing stuff on on the cars, but I think this is uh, it's good to share because you know recently I was looking for an Audi and I go on YouTube and I want to find videos of people just talking about the car. And when I was looking for my wife's RAV4, I'm like, I just want to find videos of people talking about their experience with, with the car. Um, so I'm just trying to do my due diligence and sharing my experience with the Tundra. Like I said, it's been great to me. I would still recommend it 100%, but um, if any of those things that I kind of pointed out here are deal breakers for you, then I would maybe consider looking into a different car. But uh, yeah, overall, thank you guys so much for watching. Thanks for subscribing and have a great rest of your day.